So, welcome back to the second part of the series. I hope you enjoyed the first part. Uh, in this second section, we're going to be talking about the historical context in which the New Testament grew up. And I think this might be one of the most uh, exciting and important parts of it. The reason why I like to spend a fair amount of time on the historical context that the New Testament grew up in and that early Christianity grew up in is that without the historical context, we can't understand a lot of the nuances uh, in the backdrop of the literature itself. You have to understand the context. Context is everything. So sometimes people ask, well, why did Jesus get crucified by Romans? What are the Romans doing there? Or why is the New Testament written in Greek? What does Greek have to do with anything? I thought he was a Jew. Why isn't it written in Hebrew? Um, there are all sorts of reasons why it's important to study the historical context of the New Testament in order to understand it better at its, uh, at its most basic level. So let's talk a little bit about the historical context. Ancient Greece is well where, where we will start. Uh, there were many stages and cultures within what we know of as ancient Greece. There are different periods which go back uh, really the beginning of Greek history that is interesting to us or that, that really is involved in this is what we call the Mycenaean period. Mycenaean period for Mycenae or Mycenae. Uh, for the most part, the Mycenaean period covers uh, prior to 1000 BC, somewhere in that period. And uh, the Trojan War, if the Trojan War did in, take, it did in fact take place, and it most probably did in some way, shape, or form, uh, it would have taken place during the Mycenaean period. Uh, while the story of the Trojan War, as told in a variety of di the different uh, ancient Greek dramas and plays, and of course in uh, the Iliad of Homer, uh, may not have necessarily taken place in exactly that way, and some of the heroes, I'm sure, are mythologized. Still, it appears that something of that time period, something probably took place. Um, various archaeologists have excavated the region of Ilion that may have actually had the original city of Troy, and there was some type of big conflagration that took place in that region at that time, perhaps a fire or an earthquake or a war or something of the sort. Uh, so it probably did exist, and it probably inspired what Homer later incorporated into his, his great vehicle of Greek history. And the Trojan War actually gave uh, a context or became a founding document for many of the, the cultures of not only ancient Greece, but also ancient Rome. The, uh, both of these cultures, Roman and Greek, in a lot of ways trace their heritage back to the Trojan War. For the ancient Greeks, they trace their heritage back to various heroes who were perhaps the founders of their particular villages or cities. And each of these cities had the shrine of that ancestor, the tomb of that ancestor, where that ancestor was buried. And those ancestors, in some way, shape, or form, were envisioned or remembered as having taken part in the Trojan War. Hence my meaning when I say that it was a foundational document or a vehicle for Greek history. So everyone, in some way, shape, or form, was descended from one of the heroes of the Trojan War, who were mentioned in, the, uh, in Homer's Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, the sequel to the Iliad, or some of the great dramatical plays. So, in much the same way that you find people in the southern parts of the United States referring to their great-granddaddy who fought on one side or another in the Civil War, uh, in the same way, these particular Greek city-states traced their heritage back to some particular ancient Greek hero who took part in the Trojan War. And there was their shrine, the, the tomb of that particular warrior, that particular hero, right there in the 
in the city. So it gives a very, uh, a very tangible connection for people to think of themselves as being related not only to those heroes, but also on some level to each other, that it unites them. That even though all of these different Greek city-states were perhaps warring against one another all throughout the period of, of Greek history, uh, there still was this underlying unifying factor that was based on their, their shared heritage, that they all were descended from these heroes that took part in the Trojan War. And also the name for Greece, which is, the ancient name is Hellas. <clears throat> and the adjective that's formed from this is Hellenic. Hellenic actually derives from an ancient hero. Not Helen of Troy, uh, frequently known as Helen of Troy, even though she was not from Troy itself, but was uh, stolen by the Trojan prince Paris and brought to Troy and, and I guess you'd say, uh, newly patriated into Troy. This is not the same person. We're referring to an ancient warrior of ancient Greek myths whose name was Helen. And this is a male name, actually, Helen. And in many ways, uh, he is considered the an early forefather of the Greek people that all of the Greek people are descended from. So once again, a common ancestor. It's about ancestry. It's about one's heritage. Now, in addition to that, these heroes that the Trojan War tells the story of, these heroes, most of them are in some way, shape, or form envisioned as being of semi-divine parentage. And this is one of the ways that the Greeks used to explain supernatural or extraordinary characteristics of a great person. They would retroactively or retrospectively posit that this person had semi-divine parentage. And this was very common for uh, ancient Greek, not only mythology, but ancient Greek uh, theories of, of heritage and, uh, and lineage. So one would say that, well, this guy, he was so great. He was such a great warrior. He was so smart. One of his parents must have been a deity. One of his parents must have been a god. Maybe Zeus, perhaps, the father of the gods, the, the god of the sky, the god of, of storms, who, for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, had very grave difficulty being faithful to his own wife, Hera, the mother of the gods. And he was always having some type of lustful thoughts for a human woman like her over there or her over there. Ooh, look at her. She's beautiful. And he would take on some type of form and come down and woo the woman and then seduce her. And because the gods never miss, so to speak, they are so powerful, there was always offspring. Always offspring between the god and the human. And of course, we have other situations with other male deities and human females, or in some cases, uh, female deities, a goddess, and a human male who was uh, favored with her, uh, her, her love and affection and had the opportunity to have a relationship with her. And of course, once again, some type of semi-divine offspring, half human, half divine. And this accounted for, at least in retrospect, this accounted for the very great abilities and powers that that human, that hero, had. The ability to leap tall buildings in a single bound or so forth, to kill enemies with one stroke of the sword or whatever. So, if you take this one step further, if the Greek people are descended from the ancient ancestors, the heroes. And if the heroes are descended from the, from the gods in some way, shape, or form, what does that overall make the Greek people? Descended from the gods, which explains why in their mythology the gods would always take some type of interest in the affairs of humans. Why would they be even concerned about human beings? Because the people are ultimately the offspring of the gods, hence that close relationship. And we do find all throughout the Greek stories, the Greek myths, uh, the gods taking an interest in human affairs. And sometimes the gods are very petty and they are backbiting and they are uh, capricious and they fight against one another. They fight over human affairs with one another. We see in the, in the Iliad uh, 
the vast majority of the deities getting in some way, shape, or form involved in the Trojan War and fighting on one side or another, or having their champions on one side or another, and helping those champions fight against one another. So these are some important things to remember about Greek mythology. So you have, uh, after the Archaic, uh, excuse me, after the Mycenaean Age, you have the Archaic Age, uh, during which is most probably when Homer codifies his, uh, his story of the Iliad and of the Odyssey, uh, perhaps somewhere in the, uh, in the 800s or something like that. You then have the Classical Age, as we understand it, after that, somewhere perhaps in the 600s, 500s, 400s BC, uh, which is a more historical age. We have more historical accounts of what went on at that time period. It's much less mythological. This is the age when most of the Greek dramatic plays, the comedies and the, uh, and the tragedies, come from. After that, we have what is called the Hellenistic Age. Now, Hellenistic, it is important to distinguish between Hellenic, which is just an adjective that means Greek, versus Hellenistic, which is an entirely different word, but it means something similar. Hellenistic means Greek-like. Greek-like, or Greekish, or Greekistic, one might say, Greek-like. And this refers to the stage in Greek history when Alexander the Great of Macedonia, which was a region of northern Greece, conquered what was for them the known world. He is, is in, his entire empire encompassed the eastern half of the Mediterranean and spread all the way to what had been the Persian Empire. He conquered the Persian Empire, took over what had been the Persian Empire, and his empire then expands all the way even into parts of what we call modern India. And with him, he brought culture and art of Greece. He brought uh, Greek philosophy, Greek language, all sorts of models of behavior from Greek culture. And what these regions benefit from is a synthesis of the local and the modern. And for, for them, modern is Greek. And so it becomes Greek-like, Hellenistic. It is a combination, a synthesis of the local and the Greek, producing this new modern thing that we call Hellenistic. And so all of these different cultures that had formerly been part of the Persian Empire or other individual empires, different regions, they were now encouraged to see themselves as part of something bigger than what they had formerly been. You are no longer just Assyrians. You are no longer just Judeans or Palestinians or Persians or whatever. You're part of something bigger. You're part of the Greek world. You are part of the Hellenistic Empire. You are now Greek, as well as retaining parts of your former culture. So people were still permitted to speak their old language, have their old forms of government, and so forth, but also to learn Greek and to speak Greek as part of the new cosmopolitan world. You could only trade with and associate with the other neighboring kingdoms if you knew a common language. You couldn't just speak whatever language it was that you grew up with and then assume that you're going to be able to trade with the neighbors. So having a common language, the Greek language of the time, Hellenistic Greek, was beneficial to most of these nations because it permitted increased trade, increased intercourse between these nations. So uh, for the most part, it was something good. For the most part, it was something that was readily accepted by most of these nations, with certain exceptions, which we'll get into most probably in the next session, where we talk about uh, Israel and uh, some of its varied reactions to Hellenistic influence. And it was not always positive, it was not always negative. But we'll see uh, how the Hellenistic influence spread over the areas of the world. So Hellenism, uh, Hellenistic influence, Hellenistic reforms in the various nations uh, helped to, to get these various uh, cultures that were formerly diverse to unify, to think of themselves as something bigger. So we have uh, new cities founded all over the world in Alexander's name. We have an Alexandria here, we have an Alexandria there. Uh, the more famous one, of course, is in, in northern Egypt, which still exists to this day. 
And we have a lot of these cities, well, new cities founded on the Greek model, and also certain older cities refounded on the Greek model. The Greek model of cities was the city-state, which is a city with a region of farmland and, and agricultural land and pastoral land built up around it, with the city as the central meeting place or commercial place being served by and surrounded by those agricultural lands. So this is the city-state, and the Greek word for this is the polis, which I'm sure you recognize from many words in the English language, such as metropolis, which means mother city, or political, or policy, politics, even perhaps police comes from this. So uh, polis is singular, polis, polis is plural, it's the city or the city-state, and this is the basic political, use, to use the word again, the basic political model of the Greek world. Certain of the Greek city-states, some of the more famous ones we know of, like Sparta and Athens and Corinth and ones like that, some of them were democracies or had a representative form of government. Athens is perhaps the most well-known and perhaps even the first. Uh, others are kingdoms or tyrannies to use the term in its purest form and not necessarily in a negative connotation, but that it was ruled by a small-time king, a tyrant, a tyrannus. Uh, sometimes they were considered bad people, but in its purest form, it just means a small-time king. We have uh, Sparta, which is more or less an oligarchy ruled by a few elders. But there's, these are different forms of government in different cities. And throughout the archaic and classical age of Greece, they were fighting against one another pretty regularly, and we have the long, long-standing Peloponnesian War with Athens fighting against Sparta, uh, but ultimately it is the Persians coming in, attempting to conquer Greece, that wind up in many ways galvanizing or uniting the Greeks against a common enemy and helping them to recognize, no, we are Greek peoples. So ultimately, after Persian rule, uh, we have Alexander in the 300s coming to, uh, to the forefront and conquering the Persian Empire and rendering the known world now Greek. So Alexander had a tremendous, a tremendous influence on the, uh, the, the, the Mediterranean world that ultimately spawned and gave birth to what we now know as Christianity. So it's very important to understand all of this. Uh, so we find after Alexander, the majority of the eastern half of the Mediterranean learning Greek as a language, conversing in Greek, doing commerce in Greek, uh, with Greek philosophy and art and literature and culture being that much more in the forefront. And nations competing with one another to be more and more Greek and thinking of, them, of themselves as Greek. So. Greek becomes the lingua franca, which is just a fancy word for the common language. And interestingly, by the way, as just a little tidbit, lingua franca means French language, strangely. And it's actually in Latin. The term lingua franca is Latin, meaning French language, but it's used to mean the common language. And this is uh, from a much later time period in the European Enlightenment when French was the language of the international scene, where if you wanted to get anywhere in the international cosmopolitan scene, you had to speak French. But the literary language of science and learning for the last several hundred years, if not a thousand years, was Latin, due to the Catholic Church being the main institution that held Europe together. And since all knowledge, uh, regardless of what country you were from and whatever local language you spoke, if you wanted to speak to your neighbors throughout the medieval period as a scientist, as a theologian, uh, as a politician, whatever, you had to speak and write in Latin. So this term lingua franca, coming from Latin, referring to the French language, we can then retroactively, retrospectively refer to Greek as the lingua franca. Anyway, just a funny little turn of, of events in, in human history. But Greek was the lingua franca of that time period in the Eastern Mediterranean ever since Alexander. So being that Alexander did not leave a viable male heir worth noting, it was his diadochoi, his generals, who split up his former empire. And each of them settled in a certain region 
and began to attempt to rule that region. And of course, as people are wont to do, they began to war with one another, to feud with each other, and tried to take over each other's areas. Now, of these four, the Avakoi, two of them are extremely important for our studies. One of which is Seleucus, or Seleucus, however you want to pr pronounce it. I made a spelling error there, since once again I am close to the board. Seleucus, or Selevkos. The other is Ptolemy. And his name in Greek would have been Ptolemaios. Ptolemaios. These two generals founded their own dynasties. After, the, after Seleucus, we have the Seleucids. The Seleucids. And after Ptolemy, we have the Ptolemies. Interestingly, Cleopatra was a Ptolemy. She was descended from Macedonian Greek lineage, and she, one might say, was the last of the Ptolemies in rulership in Egypt. <clears throat> so between Seleucus and Ptolemy, it is uh, the, the fate of Israel wound up being tossed back and forth between the two of them over the next two to three hundred years. And we will get into this in the next session, but suffice to say that uh, we have a Seleucid period and a Ptolemaic period of, of uh, Judean and Israelite history coming up very soon. So let's say a few words about Greco-Roman religion. And sometimes we refer to this period as Greco-Roman and not merely Greek or Roman. Uh, there was a lot of overlap, as we shall see in a second. But specifically to speak about the Greek deities, the Greek pantheon, the Greeks were polytheistic. And this is important that we learn a few terms here. And perhaps I should uh, erase a few things to give us a little bit more room. So first, one word that we should know is polytheism. And the adjective from that is polytheistic, meaning poly, many, theos in Greek meaning God. Polytheism is many gods, belief in many gods. We're going to come back to this, but this is as opposed to, in contradistinction to, monotheism, which does not merely mean worship of only one god, but also, but specifically in Greek, mono, monos in Greek means only, one and only. So this is belief in one and only god, only one god. And we'll get back to that because there are some other important distinctions we need to make. But specifically, let's bracket that. Greek religion was largely polytheistic, as was Roman religion. And among the Greek gods, we have uh, a number of different categories of gods, including the Olympian gods and the Chthonic gods. That's just a fancy word meaning the gods who lived on the earth or under the earth, in the underworld. The Olympian gods lived on Mount Olympus, in heaven, uh, and the Chthonic deities. Uh, and that, by the way, I'll give you a spelling of that. Chthonic. I know that's hard to, hard to pronounce, hard to spell too. But the Chthonic deities were, for instance, uh, Pluto. But, well, Pluto is the Roman name for him. But Hades, in Greek, who lives in the underworld, or the place that bears his name, Hades. It's also the name of the place, as well as the name of the guy. So we could talk about how we, we went over to Mark's house last night. Well, we went down to Hades' place last night. So, uh, and in the Greek tradition, Hades is not necessarily a bad place. It's not like the hell of Greek tradition, excuse me, of, of Christian tradition, uh, even though the term Hades later becomes Christianized and becomes a synonym for hell. You hear people talking about, oh, it's hotter than Hades. Uh, in that it is a synonym for hell. But in the Greek tradition, it's really not a bad place. It's just where everybody goes after death. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the god Hades, the god of the underworld, he is a Chthonic deity. You have a variety of other deities who are either on the earth or in or under the earth. So these are the two major classes of deities. And you have some of the, the major gods that we speak of. Zeus, the father of the gods, the god of storms and, and thunderbolts and the sky. Uh, his wife Hera, uh, uh, their daughter Athena, the goddess of wisdom and uh, personal valor in combat. We have Ares, the god of war, 
Apollo, who is the god of medicine and the arts and also the god of the sun. Hermes, who is the messenger of the gods. Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. So we have a number of these different deities, and they all have a specific sphere of influence that they have control over. So, <clears throat> so it's important to recognize that Greek religion was largely polytheistic, believing in many gods all at once, their coexistence. To each of these gods was given sacrifice. Now, today in modern culture, we really don't seem to understand sacrifice anymore, uh, but sacrifice was an integral part of most of these ancient religions, even ancient Israelite religion, Greek religion, Roman religion, and one might even describe sacrifice as what we would call commensality with the deity. That is, having a meal with God. Everyone's got to eat. And in most of these cultures, they, they were not vegetarian. They had vegetables, but they also ate meat. It was a way to sanctify the slaughter of an animal by doing it in a sacred act. It was not merely something like hunting where you would kill an animal and the animal was viewed as your enemy, your adversary, your opponent. In this situation, the animal is on some level your friend. It was raised by you. It is part of your family. It is part of your farm. And to sacrifice that animal requires some type of a sacred relationship with the animal and also a sacred relationship with the deity that gave you the blessings of these animals. And so what you are essentially doing is thanking the deity for everything that the deity granted to you, the prosperity that you have, the providence you have, the blessing of having the flesh of that animal, and you are inviting the deity to dinner having a meal with the deity, with the gods, saying, all right, I know that everything I have I owe to you. Let me offer you a little bit back. So it is sanctification of the slaughter of this animal and offering the deity a portion of the meal. Now, of course, a part of the, part of the sacrificial animal would go to the priest that had sacrificed it. Uh, a portion of the, of the animal would go to the deity. And in many cases, this is either a thigh bone wrapped in fat or the uh, tail of the animal, depending upon which deity we're talking about, the, a number of different uh, conditions govern this scenario. But it was usually the portion that the humans did not want, the, the poor portion, the tail. Who's going to do anything with the tail other than oxtail soup? Uh, thigh bones, you can't eat the bones. Wrapped in fat, all right. Well, the fat produces a very aromatic type of sacrifice when you burn it up. When the fat burns up, it produces an aroma that goes up to the heavens. And it seems that it was the aroma that the gods really enjoyed, that they existed on, that sustained them. So it's these unusable portions that wind up going to the deity. Now, of course, there are a number of different... Uh, myths or stories to explain why the deities accepted these portions, but the bottom line is that the deity does have enough love and compassion for humans to keep on accepting these unusable portions, the portions that the humans wouldn't want. The underlying subtext is that the gods do take care of human beings. They do have an interest in human affairs, and like a uh, a benevolent grandparent who is willing to give the good part of the, the meat or the good part of the roast to the children in the same way the deity is willing to accept the poor, the cruddy portion of the animal, the tail, the thigh bone wrapped in fat, through generation after ge generation, regardless of what the story or myth of origins is as to who fooled the gods into accepting the thigh bone wrapped in fat or whatever, the gods continue to accept that as their portion. So... It is commensality with the deity. And for the most part, uh, the remainder of the animal, if a leg went to the priest who sacrificed it, if the thigh bone or the tail goes to the god, the rest of the, the animal goes to the family that sacrificed it or the individual or the community that sacrificed it as part of a festival. And we see this carried out through, throughout most of Greek and Roman culture. It is rare that you have an animal entirely burned up on the altar. It does happen in certain situations, certain festivals, certain deities, but for the most part, animals are expensive. There is a certain economic and social element 
that is involved in how these rituals are created. You don't have people raising an animal, an expensive animal like an ox or a bull, for years and then chopping it into bits and burning the entire thing on the altar. Totally. Very rarely. For the most part, the animal is shared with the deity and the community. And it's the same thing in Israelite religion as well. It's commensality with the deity, with God, with Yahweh. And for those of you who don't want me to pronounce the holy name of God, if that's your tradition, forgive me, I'm sorry. But we're speaking uh, for scholarly reasons about the, uh, the personal name of the God of Israel. So I'm going to continue doing that, I'm sorry. So in the Israelite tradition, you have the, the animal, whatever it is, for the most part is shared between the high priests and Yahweh, and the people who, who sacrificed the animal, the family, the community, and so forth. And it is rare that you have a, a whole burnt offering. Because once again, it's expensive. There is that economic component here. So, being that sacrifice is commensality with the deity, we have to bear that in mind. Um, it is also, there's an element of appeasement, keeping the gods happy. So also there are three stages of being envisioned in the Greek tradition. You have, of course, the gods on top, then the heroes who are partly divine, as we mentioned beforehand, and then mortals. And as we had said, the mortals are uh, descended from the demigods or the heroes. They are semi-divine. And those demigods are children of deities. Now, in the Greek tradition, for the most part, in the early Greek tradition, the universe is looked at in what we would call a monistic fashion. And this is a very important word to learn. Monism. Monism. Or monistic in terms of the adjective. In a nutshell, the monistic viewpoint of the world is that the world is singular. There is only one world, only one life. There is no ultimate source of evil in the universe. There's no devil or anything like that. There is only this life, only. So once again, going back to that, that, uh, uh, that root, monos meaning only, one and only, there's only this life. There's only the physical body. There is no soul that, that survives the body into the afterlife. Uh, history is considered cyclical instead of linear. Uh, so there are a number of features to the monistic understanding of the universe. It's a philosophy, it's a worldview, a cosmology, if you will, a, a view of the universe. And we'll get back to this when we talk about Israelite religion, but I want you to understand that Greek religion and worldview is, at this stage, in this early stage, largely monistic. Now, of course, there are some qualifications to this that, that we have to recognize, but for the most part, in the early Greek tradition, there is no clear-cut sense of an afterlife or life after death. For the most part, the individual, the shade of the individual, is merely our life force, our energy. Uh, the term is, is ikon or idolon. Uh, English words taken from these are icon or idol. But your image, your shade, is what survives your body after death. But it's not really you. It's not, it's not your soul. It doesn't have your consciousness or your your ability to think. It's not your identity. It's just your image. And that, those, that life force, that energy, goes into Hades, into the underworld, into the place that belongs to the god Hades, his house. And it populates Hades. And there were, it was seen that there are more people in Hades than are here on Earth now. And there was a Greek phrase that if a person had died, it would say that they, they had gone to the majority since there are more people who have lived and died in history that are currently alive now. So you joined the majority. <clears throat> so, yes, there are certain qualifications or certain exceptions to that rule uh, in certain situations uh, conceived of a life after death, but for the most part there is no clear-cut concept of a, an eternal soul that survives the body after death. There is no clear-cut concept of an afterlife in this early stage of Greek religion. It is monistic. The opposite of this would be dualistic, and we'll get back to that later in the series. So how would one achieve some form of 
immortality. How do you obtain life after death? For the ancient Greeks, it was through memory and through your progeny. Those are the two main methods. Through having children who will continue to preserve your memory through your shrine, through your tomb, uh, giving offerings to your, to your shade. Here is, the one, here is one of those fine lines between, well, who are you offering those sacrifices, those libations to after your death? What is there if it's not a soul or a clear-cut concept of life after death? So here's the gray line. Here's the gray area. But uh, generally, you achieved immortality through your children. Have a lot of children. Have people who will preserve your memory. But also, specifically through memory, that you are... If you are a hero, you live on through song, through people remembering you. And these are some of the operative notions that, that Achilles is under in the story of the Iliad, where he wants to be remembered. So people would do great things for song, for, for memory. And I guess Achilles was successful, because here we are, 3,000 years later, if Achilles did exist. But as a character, 3,000, 3,200 years later, we still remember him. We still make movies about him. So, um, one of the few ways in which an individual could obtain in immortality in the Greek system was what we call mystery cults or mystery religions, where an individual could join a group and devote themselves to the praise and devotion to one particular deity, and in return, the deity would grant that person eternal life. We have a number of examples of this, such as the mystery cult of Dionysus, the, the Bacchic mysteries, it, it was also called, the Eleusinian mysteries, the Orphic mysteries, the Mithraic mysteries. There are quite a number of these mystery religions or mystery cults, and I'm using the term cult in its purest original form. It comes from the Latin cultus, which essentially just means a religion, a religion based around a deity, the, the reverence and worship of a deity. Usually it has a shrine or something of the sort. So in this series, we're going to remember that the term cult does not necessarily mean anything negative. The connotations that we have uh, <clears throat> attached to the term in modern society, meaning a religion that abuses or a religion that, that brainwashes people. But in, in this context, we're talking about a cultus from the Latin, just a religion. So a mystery cult, a mystery religion. The terms can be used interchangeably. But when we say mysteries, we don't mean necessarily like an Ag Agatha Christie mystery. Ooh, a whodunit. Ooh, somebody gets murdered. In the purest sense of the word, once again, it's in its original sense, mysterion in Greek is something that you are initiated into. It's a secret cult or a secret rite or ritual that you're initiated into. Not everyone gets to take part in this. You have to be trained and initiated and only to the initiates does it make any sense, the rituals that take place. So in a lot of ways, the mystery religions of ancient Greece give a certain flavor to what later would become Christianity so that even the Apostle Paul himself would sometimes refer to the mysteries of Christ. He would refer to Christianity as if it were something along the lines of a mystery cult, a mystery religion. And there were plenty of people in the ancient world that envisioned, or rather uh, viewed, Christianity, nascent, growing Christianity, as if it were perhaps another one of the mystery religions. It was compared to the Hellenistic mysteries. But we see a, a proliferation of mystery cults in the classical period of Greece well into the Hellenistic period. And it was one of the only ways that people could envision having a personal form of immortality where the individual and their soul could survive into life after death. That they would not just die off and be merely a memory or a shade, an image of what they had been. So the, the mystery religions provided the individual a way to survive after death. Now the other thing is, we have in Socratic philosophy, we have the idea of a soul and a life after death. Now uh, this is also connected to something called Greek philosophical monotheism, which I'll get into in a second. But uh, 
in the time period of Socrates, who dies in 399 BC. Uh, Socrates, the philosoph famous philosopher from, from Athens, he believes in two major things that are sort of revolutionary for Greek religion, and they signify a shift or a change in Greek religion in his period. Number one is a belief in body-soul dualism. So dualism, once again, is the opposite of monism. So dualism, excuse me, dualism, adjectives dualistic, is a philosophy or a worldview in which the world, the universe, is comprised of diametrically opposed camps. Good and evil, light and dark, spirit and the flesh, body, soul, heaven and hell, or heaven and the worldly. All of these things are part of dualistic viewpoints, dualistic cosmology. And the dualistic view of history tends to be that it is linear, a beginning and an end, as opposed to the monistic viewpoint where history is cyclical. It just continues on and on, season after season, and so forth. So these are some of the major differences. But Socrates believes in a body-soul dualism, an early form of dualistic belief, where we have inside of us a soul, something that indwells us, that is our, it is the seat of our consciousness and our identity, and it survives after death. And that is a major part of Socrates' ideology, is that there is a life after death and a reason to be good, because our soul inside us does well when we do good things. It thrives when we do good rather than do evil. So in addition to this, one of the other things that Socrates is known for is something that we today refer to as Greek philosophical monotheism. That is, that while, yes, on one level we can refer to the many gods of Greece, that underlying that is one god of the universe who created the world. And that whatever other gods there are, they are merely expressions of or allegorical representations of the one god of the universe. So this is not something that Socrates created, but he gave it a major boost. There are some philosophers prior to Socrates that that pioneered in the philosophical monotheism, but Socrates definitely gives it a major boost. And these, dualism and Greek philosophical monotheism, are two of the things that cause him to be, uh, to fall into disfavor with the Athenian hierarchy. He is considered a rabble rouser, and he has perverted not only the Athenian youth and misled them, according to the uh, Athenians, but also he has perverted the Athenian religion perverted the Greek religion. He has changed it by introducing these ideas. But these ideas are very long-lasting. They last well beyond Socrates' death. Greek philosophical monotheism is what then gives the rise to other forms of monotheism within Greek and Roman culture. There are certain pockets that, that then continue to hold on to the idea of monotheism. The Stoic religion, the Cynic religion, certain philosophical schools within Greek and Roman philosophy that continue the idea of monotheism. And it is these things that allow Christianity and Judaism to make their way throughout the Greco-Roman world and make their mark, because prior to them entering, there were some Greeks and Romans who were believing in one God. So it wasn't entirely alien to them when Jews or Greeks came to town professing monotheism, and some of these Greeks and Romans said, yeah, yeah, that's right, I've heard philosophers talk about that, one God of the universe, a creator God. I could believe that. So this paved the way for Christianity to, to find a place within Greco-Roman society. And we owe a lot of that to Socrates. So this body-soul dualism then gives um, a major shift to Greek ideas of life after death. So not everyone shifts over to this way of looking at things, but some people do. These are different streams of tradition that are that are enmeshed in the overall culture. Um, one thing I want to point out is that we need to distinguish between monism and monotheism. So don't let these two sounding like each other confuse you. Monotheism refers to one God. Monism refers to the worldview in terms of there being only this world. No life after this. No world beyond this. And there are, of course, a series of other characteristics that travel along with monism. But a monistic worldview, a culture with a monistic worldview, can very easily be polytheistic and not monotheistic. So do not confuse these. We'll get back to that later. So 
We also have the notion of ruler cult and the immortality of the ruler, which we'll talk more about later. <clears throat> but from the time of Alexander onwards, there is the tendency for some of the Greeks and also the Romans to think of the, the ruler, the king, emperor, whomever, as in some way, shape, or form divine, invested with divine power. And there is the tendency of uh, the people to offer some form of worship to the ruler, even sometimes during their life and not merely after death. In a lot of cases, after the death of the ruler, that ruler would be considered divine. They are divinized. They are now a god because they are in the world beyond. And we see that predominantly in the Roman tradition. When an emperor dies, they are now considered divinized. They have been made a god. But we also see it as far back as Alexander, with Alexander being given divine honors during his life, at least in the eastern portions of his empire. This has a long traditional history in uh, some of the cultures of the ancient Near East, particularly in Egypt, where in some, in some way the pharaoh of Egypt was considered divine, but even during his life, that he was uh, an offspring of the god or in some way an embodiment of the god and therefore was worshipped as a god during his life. But these ideas interweave and intermesh with one another and different cultures uh, cross with one another. But we see this notion of the ruler cult, the cult of the ruler, the ruler being treated as divine either in this life on some level or in the next life. We see that taken into the Roman tradition and it's going to become important for us, especially with respect to its relationship to Christianity. And one of the things that made Christianity and the Roman religion uh, mutually exclusive to one another. So this would affect the political status of Christians as an uh, unwanted minority on account of their denial of the Roman ruler cult. But we'll get back to that. So let's say a few things about Rome. Now, while Alexander was doing all this in the 330s BC, taking over the, uh, the Persian Empire, Rome was already underway as a nation, but it had not yet nearly reached its height. Rome was traditionally founded in 70, 753 BC by two brothers, Romulus and Remus. But there are also alternate stories for the foundation of Rome. And uh, one of which is that Rome originally uh, was founded, or rather that uh, the Romans are the descendants of the Trojan warrior Aeneas. And Aeneas is an individual who's mentioned in the Iliad and other stories about the Trojan War. He is a Trojan. He fights on the other side, the side opposite the Greeks. And Aeneas, after he flees the burning city of Troy with his father on his shoulder and the cultic statue of Athena in his hand, he flees Troy and ultimately, after many years of travels, settles on the peninsula of Italy and settles there and it is his descendants who would ultimately become the founders of Rome and so he is connected to the Romulus and Remus myth in some of the retellings of the story but it is essentially the uh, the national history of the Romans written many many years later under the time period of the Emperor Augustus uh, by the poet Virgil his story the Aeneid puts this story together, it takes any of the ancient uh, legends about Aeneas and codifies it and puts it in, in standard form so as to legitimate or legitimize the rulership of Augustus. And we'll say in a second why this is so important. The founding, the traditional foundation of Rome, 753 BC, two brothers who had been abandoned at birth and uh, suckled by a she-wolf and grew up uh, as feral children and so forth, they ultimately found a city. The two of them fight against one another. Romulus slays Remus much in the same way as a Cain and Abel myth. And it is Romulus who is the father of the Romans. Well, the Roman people are then subject to the authority of one of the other Italian ethnicities in the area, the Etruscans, who live in the region of Etruria. 
It is these Etruscans who are under uh, a monarchy. They are under the kings, who are known as the Tarquins due to the name of their dynasty. And the Tarquins have control over the little city-state of Rome until 510-509 BC when the Romans overthrow their Tarquin overlords and become a republic in and of themselves. And they swear at that moment in 510-509 BC that they will never be a kingdom ever again. They will never be a monarchy. And so the Romans at this time, after overthrowing their Tarquin Etruscan overlords, swear that they will never ever have kings again. And this sentiment prevails all throughout Roman history, even when they have what is essentially a monarchy or an autocracy under the empire, where there is an empire. But he's not a king. He's not a king. That is what is claimed. So, so during this time period, over the next several hundred years, Rome is a republic. They have a republican form of government where the various regions under Roman rule are ruled by a senate, and each region has its own representatives to that senate. Somewhere in the 200s BC, you have Rome facing off against another, uh, another power in the Mediterranean, which is Carthage. Carthage is in North Africa, roughly in the place that is modern Tunisia. Carthage was a very developed nation. They had their own representative form of government, but they faced off against Rome, and ultimately over the course of three wars, over about 150 years, Rome ultimately won out. And Rome became the big bad boy on the block, replacing Carthage. So by the 150s or so BC, Rome had begun to consolidate their own power in the Mediterranean. We have a number of dates here which are important to remember. <clears throat> in 197 BC, Rome, at the Battle of Cynoscephalae, defeats Philip, one of the descendants of uh, Alexander's other generals, other Diabakoi that we have not mentioned here. In 168 BC, Rome defeats Perseus at Pydna. So once again, more of Rome consolidating its power in the Mediterranean region. This is after Carthage has largely been subdued. Rome now only has to contend with some of Alexander's former uh, empires that are now in their own kingdoms in the eastern half of the Mediterranean, contending with the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and in this place, some of the other Greeks still in Macedon. And so by the middle of the the second century BC, Rome finally has subdued the majority of what the former Greek city-states were. <clears throat> so Rome now has control over Greece. So into the first century BC, now we are in the time period of Julius Caesar and the Triumvirate. You have Julius Caesar and Crassus and Pompey, three great generals who are fighting uh, to expand the boundaries of, Roman Empire, of the Roman Empire. And then at some point they begin to war with one another and we have the Roman civil wars. But during this time period, Pompey is in Syria, which had once, once again, had been part of the Greek Hellenistic Empire. Uh, uh, Syria is under the Seleucids and Pompey takes control over that region in 68 BC. In 63 BC, Pompey enters Jerusalem and takes over that region. And in the 40s, Julius Caesar assists with that transfer of power uh, in terms of Julius Caesar's machinations in Egypt, consolidating the, uh, the power of Cleopatra against her, her younger brother. And now Rome has complete control over Egypt. So by the first century BC, Rome had, the, had control over the vast majority of the Mediterranean and all of these former empires. Uh, much of which had previously been under Alexander. So Rome then becomes the power that is now in charge of Israel, which will explain to us why there are Roman soldiers who are performing the crucifixion of Jesus 
and these documents are told to us in Greek. So we have Gospels talking about the, the suffering and death of Jesus in Greek, but in a Roman province under Roman rule. So, from that point onward, Israel became a province of Rome. So, we need to understand a little bit about um, Rome's ways and Rome's customs. Now, generally, Rome adopted the ways of various neighbors in order to adapt. Rome seems generally very uh, willing to adapt and assimilate the ways of neighbors that were useful. And so we see Rome assimilating a lot of different ideas and battle tactics and uh, all sorts of uh, aspects of culture if it seemed advantageous to them. Rome also shared largely a pantheon with the Greeks. Now whether this was initially that way or whether it gradually developed that way, we see a lot of parallels between their pantheons where the Roman deities have a lot of the same characteristics as Greek deities, but a specifically Roman name. So we tend to identify Jupiter with Zeus, uh, Minerva with Athena, Juno with Hera, and so forth. So for the most part, the major gods of Rome are basically the same as the Greek deities with a lot of the same functions and stories, but different names and different nuances. So as I was saying, Rome tended to have um, a modus operandi or, or a, a style of operation where they would adapt various aspects of their culture to the various cultures that they had conquered. And we see examples of this in the Roman military where the Romans took various forms of armor or forms of, of helmets, or swords, armaments from the various peoples that they conquered in order to make themselves more effective in battle. We also see this in other aspects of Roman culture. Uh, we see the Romans having a very relatively respectful sort of uh, interest in Greek culture. So all throughout the imperial period, we see Romans uh, employing Greek slaves, well-educated Greek slaves, to tutor and educate their own children. There seems to be a preoccupation with uh, aspects of Greek culture which the Romans then adopt. So for the most part, the Romans uh, also are looked at by history as being very tolerant, very tolerant masters of those nations which they subdued or conquered. Uh, as a general rule, if a nation was helpful to Rome or collaborated with Rome during Rome's accession of that nation, we see the nation treated fairly well and within a reasonable period of time that nation is then granted citizenship in, uh, as one of Rome's provinces, and its inhabitants are then granted citizenship. We see nations being hostile to Rome in Rome's attempt to annex that nation. Then we see Rome acting in a very harsh and punitive sort of way. We see this with respect to the Greeks early on. Uh, most of uh, Rome's earliest slaves were, had been Greeks. But Rome's general toleration of the ways of their subdued constituent nations only goes so far. People generally think of Rome, historians think of Rome, as being very tolerant of the religions and the cultural ways of the, of the uh, subdued peoples. And to some degree, this was largely true. If you paid your taxes, if you owed your... Uh, if you paid your reverence to the emperor and to the ruler cult, you could continue to worship in your old cultural ways. We see a lot of um, melding of Celtic deities and Celtic religion with Roman deities. So there becomes a, a synthesis of Romano-Celtic or Romano-British deities. Uh, we see it, of course, as I had just said, with respect to the Greek and Roman pantheons. Uh, there are a lot of aspects of Greek religion that are then taken into Roman religion. But there are exceptions to this rule, and we will talk about this in the next session of this lecture series, with, particularly with respect to the Christians and the Jews. It is well known that the Christians fell afoul 
uh, ran afoul of the Romans on account of the Christians' unwillingness to perform certain sacrifices that the Romans demanded, as we were talking beforehand about the ruler cult. During the imperial period, the emperor was seen as in some way, shape, or form having divine power invested in him. While he was generally not envisioned as being a god during his life, we do see after the emperor's death him being divinized, that he becomes a god after death, a lesser divinity, not the high gods like Jupiter or, or Juno or anything like that, but a, a, a divinity, a, a divus, the term is. But during his life, he is invested, one might say, with the power of the gods. He has a genius, which is spelled genius in English. I don't even have to put it on the board. It's genius, but it's pronounced genius. And it is his guardian spirit. It is the spirit that is divine that protects him or guides him in his authority as emperor. So one might say this is a precursor to the notion of, of the divine right of kings that we see in uh, the Middle Ages in Europe in the Christian period, where the king of whatever nation is invested with divine power or divine authority that God has chosen him to rule his people. This, of course, ensures a certain amount of subservience from the people, a certain amount of obedience to the king in the Middle Ages. The same thing in the Roman period. With the Roman people envisioning the Roman emperor as having that divine authority invested in him by way of his genius, his guardian spirit, the Roman people see him as having some divine right to rule. And we see this very notion embodied in, as we had mentioned earlier, Virgil's story of the Aeneid, which is written during the time of the Emperor Augustus, the first official Roman emperor, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, the great general and statesman, dictator for life, but never emperor. His son, his adopted son, the first Emperor Augustus, finds that it is important that some document, some founding document, be written to legitimize his rule. Because remember what we said about the Roman people. They did not want kings. Never again after the Tarquins should we have kings. So how do you deal with a person who essentially has the power of a king? Number one, you don't call him a king and you leave certain vestiges of a Republican representative government to uh, assist the, the autocrat, this emperor, much in the same way that modern England has a constitutional monarchy, in the same way Rome might have been considered something along the lines of a constitutional monarchy at that time period, where the Senate supports, advises, and backs up the emperor and his decisions. But the emperor is not a king, he's not a king, so, so this semblance of, of representative government is maintained so as not to make people afraid of the fact that they essentially have a king or an autocrat. But in addition to that, you have to somehow, by way of the mythology, by way of history, by way of the lore of the Roman people, you have to legitimize the rulership of that emperor. And Augustus did this through the... Roman court poet Virgil, or Virgilius, when he wrote his Aeneid, which retells the entire story of the ancient warrior Aeneas with an eye towards the future, which is now the present in the time of the Emperor Augustus, and how ultimately Augustus would be the savior of the Roman people and would be the culmination of all that had been Rome from, uh, from Aeneas all the way down through the public, through Julius Caesar, and ultimately embodied in Augustus. So then ultimately it is the ruler cult that allows the Roman people to envision Augustus as having this genius. So he is, he is revered, maybe worshipped, maybe not worshipped. It depends on how you define the term. But he is revered by way of pouring out a libation or making a sacrifice, perhaps on an annual basis or some type of periodic basis, in honor of his genius, his guardian spirit. So one would toast the health of the emperor. One would pour out a libation to the life of, and health of the emperor, to his guardian spirit. And it is this very act that was required of Christians and that Christians refused to do. Why did they refuse to do it? Because they were originally from a Jewish monotheistic context and there could be only one God. And any reverence or worship given to other gods or humans posing as gods was considered idolatry. 
and therefore blasphemy. And so the Christians refused to give this form of worship or obeisance to the Roman emperors throughout the imperial period, and this is one of the primary reasons why the Christians are persecuted by the Romans. Now we'll get further into this, but we do need to recognize that there is this dark side, if you will, to Roman rule. So on one hand, the Romans were looked at as being tolerant masters, always willing to allow the local conquered peoples to persist in, in carrying out and worshiping in their religion, as long as you were also willing to follow the rules of Rome and worship in the form of Roman religion that had produced the great empire of Rome, that had sustained Rome. So as long as you gave respect to the state gods of Rome, the, the ones such as Jupiter and Mars and Minerva and Juno and all of these other gods who had essentially given the great empire to Rome, as long as the constituent peoples would continue to worship in that fashion alongside of their own indigenous forms of, of worship, then the Romans would have no problem with it. But there were certain situations in which, like this with the Christians, the Romans were very, very intolerant and very harsh. We will see uh, in the next lecture in this series a little bit about Rome's relationship with the Jews because this paves the way for our understanding of the Romans' relationship with the Christians. The Romans did have a sort of love-hate relationship with the Jews. The Jews did to some degree enjoy a special category of status within the Roman Empire. The religion was generally considered what we call, what we call a religio licita or a legal religion, an authorized religion, but there were certain situations in which this was compromised and uh, the Romans did react at times toward the Jewish community with tremendous severity and harshness. And we will handle this next time.